Thank you for your attention and welcome to this presentation on 10 ways companies can keep themselves ethical. 10 ways by which managers can keep their companies ethical. Now, hiring ethical managers can be like the single most important thing you can do for your company because when I go to church, for instance, my pastor always says that he will hire for loyalty any day and not for competence alone. So there's a certain blessing in being competent. But I believe that being ethical, being loyal, being committed sometimes trumps competence alone. So the first thing you can do as CEO, board chair, senior management, the first thing you can do is actually ensuring that when you're hiring, you choose ethical leaders. Because if you have a CEO who's ethical, the battle is twice won. Things you need to ask yourself in choosing an ethical leader range from asking the candidate, for instance, describe some workplace dilemma that they've encountered and what they did to resolve say. You can ask them to sort of work around some hypothetical ethical dilemma and get a sense of how they will handle it. You can ask them questions attendant to their opinion regarding current ethical business issues that flow from Kenya, that flow from the U.S., that flow from the U.K. I mean, recently you, you probably are aware of the minister in the U.K. who tendered in his resignation only because he came late to parliament. And when parliament accosted him, he told them he was sorry he was late, and because he had a particularly high pedigree for always being on time, he resigned. Needless to say, the Prime Minister refused to accept his resignation and he continued his work. But for a Minister of State to say they want to stop a job because they came to Parliament late for a meeting, that for me showed that this particular gentleman was working with particularly high ethical standards. So one way to create an ethical climate, one way to make sure your company is ethical, one way managers can make their companies ethical is to choose ethical leaders. Number two, have a totally independent board of directors. Board of directors. A very independent board of directors can make or break your company. I'm sure you've heard of the corporate governance term CEO duality where you have an executive CEO, the man is CEO and is also board chair. Those kinds of things definitely speak of non-independence of that board. But even when the CEO serves, not as chair, but serves of the company, you must make sure that those who are non-executive directors always exceed those who are executive directors. There will be a false balance in that particular institution. Board of directors totally matter because they are the ones who ensure effective corporate governance, ensure that a high code of moral standards is kept, a high ethical standard is kept. And if you own a company, please, my admonition to you is that give the board as much independence as possible. Because that's one key way to avoid things like nepotism, where your son is the board chair, your cousin is the board chair, your wife's sister is on the board, your cousin is on the board, your, your second cousin is on the board, and the last one is, is, is your son's girlfriend. It becomes a problem. You can't have a situation where you have so much nepotism on the board. And asking outsiders to serve helps to maintain the integrity of the board. You need to also ensure that the board is able to deal with issues because they have the best information available to them. Within the board as well, have a certain institutional structure that ensures that people don't serve on the board for 72 years. Once in a while, you must refresh the board composition as well to make sure the ideas are innovative and people are not doing things for their own selfish interests. So try as much as possible to ensure a very independent board of directors. Third thing is have a living code of ethics. Living code of ethics means that a code of ethics has been used that's being implemented, that is being reviewed, that is being overhauled, that, that is being used at senior management, used at middle management, used at junior management. Because look, all said and done, the code of ethics can just be a piece of paper. But the best code of ethics, the codes of ethics apply to everyone in the company. 
They promote transparency, promote accountability, and the board is as committed to the values as our senior management and every other person operating the entity. If you're in an institution, for instance, that operates in an industry with high rate of technological change, you need to ensure that your course of ethics lifts up to the pace of change to ensure that you have a code of ethics that is always relevant to the times in which you're operating. Otherwise, obsolescence can catch up with this code of ethics very, very quickly, and so you don't have any value for the code of ethics. The next thing you need to contend with is trying to explain the reasoning behind your code of ethics. Because knowledge is power. And the easiest way to get your employees to adhere to your code is to explain why the code is so important. For example, say that your code of ethics is important because it prohibits family members from operating the same department. So if there are rules against nepotism and so on and so forth, show how this brings value to the organization and helps to further the strategic objectives of the organization. Apply the ethical standards to everyone. Nothing sucks organizational morale or organizational commitment to a code of ethical conduct more quickly than the perception that different rules apply to different people within the same organization. Most people would expect leaders in an organization to set an example for the rest of the group they are leading. And if employees spell any hypocrisy, double dealing, especially from the executive office, you are sure that you are going to face very high ethical dilemmas. So managers who want to create a high ethical climate must, just, must not just work their talk, but must ensure that they craft effective ethical standards that apply equally to everyone within the organization. Then the next thing to co consider is value ethics over performance. Now, oftentimes, high-performing workers sometimes, oftentimes, more often than not, are not held to the same ethical rules as poor performers. Because, you see, there's a feeling that high-performing employees can break a few rules. Once they are still hitting the high scores and bringing a lot of cash, you can always excuse them when they do the wrong thing. So you can counteract this strong tendency to ignore ethical issues or, or promote ethical lapses among high performers by one. Structuring your reward systems, your incentive packages, your reward programs to encourage ethical compliance so that it's not just how well you do, but the way in which you did well. So that ethical compliance becomes as important as meeting organizational targets that don't necessarily have to do with ethical behavior which is really a contradiction term because you would think that the more ethical you are, the stronger you become at meeting this target. But somehow, ethical, high performance sometimes takes shortcuts, which could be overlooked. So make sure you structure reward programs to encourage ethical compliance. Second recommendation I want to make to you, if you want to value ethics or performance, is that give the responsibility of enforcing ethical standards to someone else. So that the high-performing employees don't become a law unto themselves. Next thing, appoint an ethics committee that becomes the guardian of your code of ethics, implements it, ensures compliance, and takes everyone forward. The next thing you want to consider is what we call engagement of stakeholders. Now, to engage stakeholders in your ethical culture, you first have to identify them and their concerns. So do some kind of stakeholder audit and make sure that the concerns of your various stakeholder audiences are fed ab initio into the formulation of your ethical course of ethical conduct. That way, people are buying from day one. And then when there are deviations, you can hold people to account because they have an input into the formulation of the course of ethics ab initio. Generally, the more communication parts you build 
between your company and your stakeholders, the more successful you'll be in getting them to align, to toe the line, and to generally maintain your company's ethical posture. Next thing which I think is so useful is support industry-wide regulation. Companies that sincerely promote sensible regulation of the industry get an image boost that can translate into new customers and higher revenues. So, for instance, when you take um, business schools globally, the gold standard for accreditation is what is called the AACSB accreditation. We also have what is called a triple crown, which means that for any business school globally, if you're able to acquire AACSB accreditation, acquire Equis, which is a European-based accreditation, and acquire AMBA, which is the Association of MBA accreditation, also from the UK, you are totally good to go. I mean, in Africa, for instance, I don't think there are more than five or six universities or business schools that have acquired this famous Triple Crown accreditation. But what would Triple Crown mean in terms of ethical standard, moral standard, high global standards? Once you're able to acquire ACSB accreditation, Equus accreditation, AMBA accreditation, what happens is that the it's a radical transformation of the internal processes that come with the way the business school is run. And suddenly, you find that you're working with standards that are not peculiar only to the geographical context in which you work, but suddenly are useful for any global person who wants to interact with you. So suddenly, students know that when they come to your school, they will get the same quality of education as any other university that carries the same triple crown accreditation. By the same token, if you work in banking or in insurance or you are a, a big five audit firm, there are global standards of accounting regulations, financial service regulations, banking regulations that you can aspire to and get accreditation for. Because once you are supporting industry-wide regulation, following industry-wide codes of ethical conduct, you find that you are forced to align and you start aspiring to standards that are even beyond what you would have worked with if you are considering your company alone. So I would recommend strongly that look, look at industry groups, look at global groups, look at the industry which you operate and ensure that if you can, you don't just have your own local codes of ethics alone or ethical standards alone, but you can aspire to higher industry or globally recognized regulation that makes you a more credible institution in the way you execute your strategic agenda going forward. Next thing you can consider is create an environment where people would want to come to work every day. Now, it's very important as a leader to not create an environment where your followers want to revolt. It's a very dangerous way to run an organization. So try hard to make your employees content by assigning employees, for instance, to jobs they are well suited to. So issues of job audit, HR audits, uh, uh, job skill fit, things like, you know, getting a sense of people's training gaps and their skill needs and feeling the same and having very honest and transparent performance management appraisal systems all those things help in creating an environment where people want to come to work every day and want to come to work happy and want to make a meaningful contribution. In that same regard, give employees a certain ability to make concrete suggestions to improving the way work is done. Go back. Ah! Meaningful ways to make suggestions to the company in which they work. And recognize that employees have lives outside the workplace as well. So strive hard to ensure that they maintain a healthy work-life balance. These sorts of strategies will help to reduce turnover, make your employees more committed to you, and then you have employees that do better with you. The next thing is stay alert to ethical threats. So I chatted with my friend, Dr. Um, Philip Atukefio this morning after our usual morning exercise, and he he is an expert in security and diplomacy, and he said, look, Bob, I keep hearing things like 
security threat, security threat. They are not like security threat. He said to me, listen, security typically has three components. It has something called a reference object. Then it has something called a threat. Now the threat is in relation to reference object. And security is the third arm that becomes a mitigating or a stopping factor between the threat you are facing and the reference object that is the focus of the threat. So, based on the knowledge I just gained this morning myself, I want to discuss the issue of staying alert to ethical threats. Everybody who works in an organization is a reference object. And threats can come to you in, the terms, of, in terms of possible bribes, possible nepotism, and so on and so forth. So what organizations need to do in creating and maintaining an ethical culture is to put in mechanisms that ensure that the reference object, who is the employee, is shielded from the threats that come from all the sources of unethical behavior. So, things like training, things like constant reminders about how ethics matters, integrating ethical concerns into the overall business strategy. When you are launching a new product, be very careful about the ethical concerns that come with the product and school your various internal stakeholder audiences on how to address the threats or the concerns if customers approach them. So staying alert to ethical threats is a very important way of handling an organization that wants to reduce the ethical dilemmas that are being created and how managers can assist in overcoming say. So I want to thank you for listening to this presentation on 10 ways managers can overcome ethical dilemmas. And I pray that you can mainstream some of these ideas into your organization to make it a far more resilient one so we can have organizations in Africa that last for a long time and have transgenerational impacts. Thank you for listening. I'll come your way again very soon. God bless you.